Welcome everyone to another Crown Seminar. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a very special Crown Seminar because of our two wonderful guests today. Um, as you know, the topic of today is called One War, Two Countries, Syria and Ukraine, and it features our special guests, um, Deborah Amos and Wendy Perlman. Um, as always, I'm going to introduce our wonderful guests and they will, um, and then um, uh, Deb is going to speak for about seven to 10 minutes, and then she will be in conversation with Wendy for another, let's say, 30 minutes, and then we're going to take a Q&A. Please remember that the chat function is not where to put your questions, but underneath where it says Q&A, and we will see your questions, and hopefully there'll be time for a wonderful discussion. Um, now, the great thing about, on the one hand, having someone like Deborah Amos be our guest is nice because, you know, we, I don't need to even introduce her. On the other hand, if I wanted to introduce her, it would take the whole hour and a half. So very shortly, um, she's an award-winning international correspondent for NPR News. And these awards include a, Pe include a Peabody, an Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award, and my favorite part, which is the Emmy. I need to ask her about her Emmy. Um, her work was regularly features um, groundbreaking reporting on the Middle East and on refugees in the United States um, and other parts of the world. She Her work has appeared, you've all heard it, on Morning Edition, Weekend Edition, All Things Considered. And before she was at NPR, of course, she was on ABC's Nightline and PBS's Frontline. Currently, in addition to all of that, um, Deb is a Ferris professor at Princeton, where she teaches journalism during the fall term. She's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She is also the author of two books, uh, Eclipse of the Sunnis, Power, Exile, and Upheaval in the Middle East, and Lines in the Sand, Desert Storm, and the Remaking of the Arab World. Her talk today is going to be based on her third book project, and we're very excited to hear about this. Um, Wendy Perlman, who will be in conversation with Deb, also does not need much introduction to um, our audience today, but she is um, the professor of political science at Northwestern University, where she holds the Charles Deering McCormick Professorship of Teaching Excellence and the Crown Professorship of Middle East Studies. So she's like our twin sister um, back there in Illinois. She earned a PhD from Harvard University, an MA from Georgetown, and a BA from Brown. And as you all know, her research focuses on comparative politics of the Middle East, social movements, political violence, refugees, migrations, emotions, and mobilization, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. She's the author of many books, including the one that my students read this week, We Crossed a Bridge um, and It Trembled, which is a fabulous, fabulous book. Um, I'm not surprised that she's currently completing her sixth book, um, which is a collection of interviews with displaced Syrians exploring their stories and reflections on the meaning of home, and it's forthcoming from um, Liverite Books in 2023. So this year, um, we get the privilege of reading hopefully both books. Um, on that note, I hand the microphone to the wonderful Deb Amos and uh, take it from there. Thank you so much. That was very, very nice. And I think we're all twins in some ways. All of us have been working on the same things, uh, which is why we're all interested in, in this topic. Um, I, I've called it one war, two countries. In some ways, you can think of it as Syria as the off-Broadway um, to Ukraine's uh, you know, star uh, in, in a war that in some ways is about the same kind of things. And so I want to argue that so much of what's happening in Ukraine uh, can be seen and analyzed through what happened in Syria. I don't think that it was uh, first in his mind, uh, Vladimir Putin, to, to go to Syria in 2015. That argument was made by Qasem Soleimani, who flew to Moscow he was the architect of, of much of Iran's strategy in the region, um, a very important member of, of the elite in the country. And it was his job to make the case uh, to Putin that Saddam was, uh, Saddam, I'm sorry, Assad was in danger. Uh, the regime was in danger of falling. Um, it was precarious. And if the Russians didn't step in, 
it might be the end of that regime. Um, they begin their involvement uh, in September 2015, um, where they launch a series of airstrikes against anti-government forces. Um, I think it was a welcome step uh, by, by Western powers, certainly in the United States. Uh, President Obama at the time um, declared that the Russians would get bogged down there, which they did not. Uh, this would be more trouble for them than it appeared. But certainly in the West, Putin was seen as uh, a solution rather than a problem in Syria. The world was worried about ISIS. Uh, they were worried about these uh, Islamist rebels, and they had hoped that Russia uh, would have a hand in, in quelling that uprising. The problem, of course, was that the measures that the Russians took in Syria looked an awful lot like war crimes. Uh, they targeted hospitals in rebel areas. They uh, targeted schools in rebel areas. They targeted bread lines in rebel areas. And nobody said much about that tactic. Uh, they were the beneficiaries of something that's been called the age of impunity. Um, the, the man who's sort of given a title to this era uh, is David Miliband. And David Miliband runs um, a refugee agency, one of the largest refugee agencies in the country. And he wrote a book on the age of impunity. And I think he's right about this. And what he talks about is when armed groups can do anything, they do everything. And if there is one lesson I believe that Moscow has learned over the last 15 years is if you can do everything, you will do anything. Uh, Putin's record begins in Chechnya. Um, you can also see these sort of brutal tactics um, in Crimea. You can see them in Donbass. You can see them in Hershon. And eventually you will see them in Ukraine. Nothing that happened in Ukraine in the early days of that war was a surprise to any Syrian. They'd seen it all before. They even knew the names of the commanders because they had seen them on Syrian television. Um, I'm going to give you sort of a teeny history about how I came to this topic. And it has to do with having a fellowship in 2022. I applied for it because I wanted to be in the courtroom uh, for a Syrian war crimes trial, the first relatively big trial that there was going to be. Um, if you cover the Middle East for long enough, you get very interested in accountability, especially because we've all been in this age of impunity. And I wanted to be sure that I could cover that trial. It was an interesting trial on the, on the part of the Germans. It was done under uh, a legal uh, philosophy called universal jurisdiction. And, and the Germans passed this in the legislature in 20, 2002. Uh, it was all a part of setting up the International Criminal Court and what's called the Rome Statutes. These were uh, legislative moves um, that states would make so that they were in compliance with the International Criminal Court. And Germany was one of the first to pass those rules. And what it meant was, if a war criminal turned up on your in your country, whether they were a German citizen or not, you could try them. Now, this uh, sputtered along after 2002. There weren't that many cases where it was relevant. But in 2014, more than a million Syrians arrived in Germany. And not only did refugees arrive, so did... Uh, regime operatives, so did uh, defecting um, military, defecting intelligence. There were a lot of people who came to Germany from Syria. And certainly those who came from the regime understood um, this age of immunity. They figured that if they had defected from the regime, uh, then their past sins were forgiven. Not quite true in German jurisprudence. And so what you began to see in Germany were the first universal jurisdiction trials. Um, and this is yet another connection that Ukraine has to Syria, because as Europe begins to staff up for these trials, and it wasn't just the Germans, they were certainly the leading 
um, uh, the leading figure in this, but the French had these trials. Sweden is working on these trials. Norway is because when that Syrian diaspora came through Europe, there were there were many regime operatives who also came with them, ripe for trial. Um, so the model begins to be set for Ukraine, and that is in Europe almost every war crimes investigative unit began to take on staff. And they took on staff that were specialists in tribunals, specialists in war crimes, the modern kind, not the old kind. I mean, these are war crimes investigating teams who were still working on World War II um, when this movement began and now had moved into the present. There were ISIS people. Um, there were trials uh, about Yazidis to be done. Um, and it, it, and these people had plenty of evidence online, videos of them, um, you know, uh, being part of some assassination team. There was a trial like that in, in Syria. In Germany, you had a colonel who had arrived who felt that because he defected from his former job and even represented the opposition um, in a peace conference in Geneva that didn't quite go anywhere, but he did. Uh, he moved to Germany soon after that. But what happened is there were too many Syrians uh, who recognized him, who stayed when he first arrived in the same refugee uh, housing, uh, and they recognized this colonel and they would tell German police that there was a guy who had tortured them uh, back in Damascus. Uh, and eventually he was arrested in 2019. And it was in January 2022 when I was there for the sentencing. And he was sentenced uh, for life for crimes against humanity. And it was a model for what is possible in Ukraine uh, for a number of reasons. One, universal jurisdiction means any court in Europe could take on a case where, let's say, a Russian soldier shows up 10 years from now um, and could take on a war crimes trial across Europe. That is one connection to Syria. And here's the second one, which I've only found out recently, which is kind of interesting. And that is that there is a group uh, in Syria called Sija. It is the Center for um, uh, International Justice and Accountability. And Sija for the past 10 years has been collecting documents in Syria. Every time um, there was a militia attack on a Syrian government uh, position and a town fell, then the siege uh, activists would come in with trucks and they would take documents out of whatever the local authority was and they would spirit them away first to Lebanon and then to a secret location in Europe where they would organize them, translate them, uh, give them all a CR code and organize them for trials across Europe. They were instrumental in a dossier on the colonel who was tried um, in Germany. And they have become expert at evidence management. Um, they have just signed on in Ukraine uh, and they will help the Ukrainians in uh, this vast amount of evidence that's being collected. Um, in Ukraine and how to manage a linkage case. This is what the Seja people have learned over time. Every trial in Germany is to be linked all the way up to Bashar al-Assad with documents that show how many of these orders that he gave. This is something that Ukraine is going to want to do um, with Russian commanders all the way to Vladimir Putin. And so Seja has learned how to do this. So they have now taken up... Um, uh, the cause with Ukraine. And the third uh, way that Syria is in some ways the off-Broadway production is in open source investigations. Um, uh, there are plenty of people who are now known for open source investigations. Uh, Bellingcat is, is sort of the most well-known. Uh, forensic architecture, Syrian archives, otherwise now known as mnemonics, they all get their start in Syria. Um, 
Bellingcat began as a blog uh, called Brown Moses and has grown into this remarkable investigative arm um, uh, of open source researchers who have moved their skills also to Ukraine. And much of the evidence for the war crimes trials that will come at some moment, we don't know when, it took quite a while for the first Syrian trial to happen, almost 10 years after the beginning of the uprising. So there's no reason to expect that Ukraine uh, comes any quicker than that. But so much of the evidence will be this open source investigation, uh, documentation, evidence gathering um, that began in Syria. And some of the same people are doing it today. The Syrian archives, now known as mnemonics, um, set up shop in Berlin in 2014 and begins uh, a essentially um, cataloging evidence for the for the Syrian uprising. What has happened over time is uh, the university at Berkeley, as well as the UN uh, Human Rights Commission, has set up what's what's called their protocols for how you turn this kind of evidence. Um, and make it available to the International Criminal Court or national courts in Germany. And there are now protocols to do this, to, to take evidence from social media and, and make it acceptable um, in international courtrooms. That begins in Syria. Um, Syrian Archives is called Mnemonics. They are now doing this kind of work for both Yemen, for Sudan, and finally, Ukraine. And so you have sort of two parallel stories. One is the story of war and how uh, Russia in an age of um, impunity was able to move from Chechnya all the way through Syria to Ukraine. And you have the same story uh, that begins in Syria and that is the war crime fighters um, and the new skills that have come online, the new people who are doing this uh, kind of information, and how both groups have now come together um, to, uh, to work on Ukraine. And it is conceivable, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, that this is the beginning of a international um, architecture uh, for a rules-based international system. So many people bemoaned the end of that when Ukraine started. I'm not sure how, how resilient that system was, uh, but it appears that we are building a new one. And now I'm going to open it to uh, Wendy so that we can have a discussion, because that is a better format, I find, in webinars than someone just speaking in a little box. And no, you could go on speaking in your little box forever. This was 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 fascinating. And these two parallel stories that you lay out the sort of the age of impunity on the one hand, and perhaps what might transform an age of impunity to a new age of accountability on the other is almost this you know, struggle of good and evil. And is there a chance that accountability could could win out? So I want to maybe uh, end with that sort of question, which is the big takeaway. But first, I'd love if you could tell us a little bit more about what you saw in these trials in Germany. I mean, you were there in the in the courtroom or around the courthouse. What was the atmosphere like? I was in the, I was in the courtroom. Um, yeah, what was, did you see, um, both just to bring it alive for us and also what you extract from that experience about the meaning and significance of these, these developments? So for a long time, in, in I mean, the trial was two years long. And for a long time, I was covering it from my dining room in, in America. And I had to do that because we were in the, we were in the age of COVID, um, not impunity or accountability, the age of COVID. Um, but nevertheless, this trial went on. And when you looked at the courtroom and I could see it, um, it had, uh, you know, plexiglass boxes around everybody, the judges, the defendant, the attorneys. I didn't get there till 2021. Um, and there was still COVID, uh, but we could now travel. There were vaccines. And so I got to the courtroom in 2021 and spent two days in, in the courtroom. German jurisprudence is odd. Here's one thing that's odd about it. There are 
no transcripts. Doesn't exist. And so you have to be in the courtroom to, um, to see what is going on. However, it is also in German. And so unless you have a translator sitting right next to you and whispering in your ear, you just kind of have to figure out what's going on on your own. And I didn't have a translator. Um, and in some ways, I then was confronted with the emotion of the trial rather than the facts of the trial, because that's all I could see. So I could see Anwar Reslan, the Syrian colonel, um, who was trying his best to look in, in control, be mused by the proceedings. You know, he would stare at certain witnesses. He somehow, I mean, remember, this guy was a professional interrogator right? He had his own particular skills. And he, I think he knew which witness he could rattle. Um, and so, you know, he was sitting on one side of the courtroom um, and the translators and, and the prosecution was on this side and the witnesses were here and, and we could see the judges there. So the most compelling day for me was a witness who was older than most, because this was a, a youth rebellion, as you know. And this man was probably in his 60s. And he had a last name that was shared by a former um, prime minister of Syria. So I knew well enough about how it works in Syria that he came from a prominent family. He had a, a car dealership in Damascus. He had a big house. Um, his wife and his daughter, early in the Syrian uprising in 2011, uh, protested um, a uh, uh, crackdown in the town of Dara in, in southern Syria. That's the, that was the beginning of the revolt. And he was arrested for that. And when he was brought into um, to, uh, jail, he meets the colonel. He meets Ruslan. And they know each other because they are from the elite, you know, population of, of Syria. And Ruslan says to him, as he testifies in court, you should have known better. Your wife and your daughter, you don't have control of them. You know to not do this kind of thing. He said, and we are going to make sure that you remember this forever. And he turns to a guy and he says, give him an extra dose of electricity. And he walks out with him. And at that point in the proceedings, the witness breaks down and begins to cry. I can't see any of that because his back is to me. I can just see the judges and I can see their faces and I know something is terribly wrong. And at some moment they say, we will now take a break. Everybody gets up and walks out of the courtroom. I mean, you have to imagine what it feels like to have Raslan within two feet of you. You have not seen him since the day he ordered extra electricity for your torture. And now there you are. And so it was quite a moving moment. And I will tell one more story about this. And that is, I was there on the last day when the verdict was read out. And then everybody was out in front of the courtroom because there were a lot of reporters. Everybody wanted to um, ask questions. And I interviewed, there was a, a group of six Syrians who spoke to the court on the last day before the verdict was read out. All of them had been exceedingly thoughtful. They spoke German. They were very proud of that. And so they gave their, their final thoughts in, um, in German. And afterwards, I interviewed most of them. And the most thoughtful, they I don't know what they said seems so cliched. Um, one of them said, the smartest of them, I was very happy to be in the courtroom because this was a court of law and the law said he was guilty. It was more than they did for us. And I was proud. That was an interesting notion. I was proud. And I thought, really? That's what you feel? That all of this? And that's what you get? Maybe two weeks later, there was a trial in the United States and the family um, of a journalist um, 
I can't remember his first name at this moment, but Mr. Foley is beheaded by ISIS. And this is a year that the British agree to extradite the man who killed him. And they are in a courtroom in Virginia. And of course, he gets a life sentence. And afterwards, uh, the father of James Foley says to reporters on the steps, I was proud to be here, that in a court of law, he was found guilty. It was more than he did for my son. And I thought, there you are. That is the thing that is common to people who sit in those trials. And for all of those who say international justice is, you know, random, uh, you don't get much, it's performative. Uh, for those who are directly affected, it is incredibly meaningful. Wow. <laughs> uh, I mean, these st stories are, are riveting. And, and thank you, because in, in discussing things like evidence and documentation, and we're imagining truckloads of paperwork and, and, and long trials, and um, the cynicism of an age of impunity, it can be difficult to lose sight on, of, on human terms what all of this really means um, for, uh, for, for victims and, uh, and for societies. Um, I know. Let me tell you one more tiny, and it may, yeah. you may just think of it. So I never got to talk to him, but I'm, I'm not going to give up. You know, Germany also has a war crimes investigative unit. And I always wondered who those people were and how they went about what they did. And they don't ever talk. Um, but one of them retired, the, the head of the Syrian unit retired. He was in the courtroom for the verdict. And he gave an interview and what he said, I thought what he said was so touching. He said, we understood that we should never go to a refu Syrian refugee's house in uniform because we knew where they'd come from. And we knew that they didn't trust the police, that they were scared of the police. So we never went. Because, you know, of course, we were going to come in the late afternoon, the early evening, the very time that you're scared to death if a cop knocks on your door. But we needed them to trust us because we needed them to tell us what they knew as witnesses. And I thought, wow, that you would do this for a living and you would understand, you know, a witness well enough to do that. I thought that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, your last comment sort of anticipated a, a question I had in terms of this more cynical critique that these this, these accountability efforts are are performative, that it catches relatively small fish um, rather than high up political leaders. Or there, but there might be hope, as you said, with the sort of linkage work. Um, is this this critique that sort of uh, uh, undermines the importance and meaningfulness of these accountability efforts. Is this a critique that you've heard among Syrians or Ukrainians themselves, ordinary people who have, have suffered the consequences of war crimes, or is this more a critique of outsiders? Um, or, or have you have you heard from from Syrians and Ukrainians themselves? Yeah. Oh, this doesn't matter so much. And what's sure. I guess the sense of of debate or diversity of of sentiments and attitudes you've seen amongst Ukrainians and Syrians about about all of this? And the problem, Wendy, is all of it is true. Yeah. The critiques are true, and the ones who were in the courtroom and who got something out of it that's true too. That's the problem with international law. And I just did a big long story at Yale because uh, Yale uh, is doing an invest, it has done an investigation on Russian kidnapping of Ukrainian kids. And there was a moment that I got a teeny bit cynical myself and I said, big deal. So what happens with this? And um, Nathaniel Raymond, who runs the place said, God, I didn't think you'd be like this. And, and he said, all right, I'm going to tell you what my mentor told me. Uh, war crimes trials are not for you. You never know who the stakeholders are. You never know what the outcome of a trial will be and what it will set off. War crimes tribunals are arbitrary. Um, sometimes they really aren't about justice. 
but you have to do it anyway. And I think that that's the only answer. You have to do it anyway, because what else are you going to do? You know, I mean, we have Nuremberg as a model. Um, we have the Tokyo trials as a model. Um, now we're trying to craft a new one because all of those, we've had some serious failures. We didn't have a way to do this. That's how we got into the era of impunity. And so, I don't know, whichever way this story turns out is going to be important. Either we can't do it, we can't figure out a way uh, to figure out a new system, or we do. Um, but, you know, I can't imagine any of us saying, oh, you know, maybe we shouldn't have done Nuremberg. I mean, did we really need to do that? That was certainly an argument in Germany. Um, you know, they didn't do the Holocaust trials until the 60s. And there were a lot of Germans who, who said, oh, why are you bothering those nice old people? They've been quiet since the war. But justice is justice. And, you know, Germany just had what perhaps will be their last World War II case of a 93-year-old woman who was a secretary in a concentration camp. And, you know, she'd been living a quiet life all these years. Um, and they tried her. They tried her about six months ago. So, yes, all true. <laughs> right. No, it's fascinating because when you when you first began like being the age of um, impunity and I my first idea was, oh, then the opposite of impunity is accountability. Do we have these two competing paradigms? But I think what you're saying is is maybe the the um, the way of fighting impunity is not necessarily getting to accountability. There could be some other paradigm. It's not impunity or accountability, but a whole range of outcomes in the middle of, of people working and doing things that are tremendously meaningful for them that could have a whole host of intended or unintended consequences that are short of justice and true accountability, yes. but make change and create solace and are, are meaningful politically, socially, culturally, personally. So it could be what fights impunity is not necessarily accountability. It could be, I'm not sure what other words. I know, I don't think we have a word, but you're, you're right. I mean, think about this. So for the first time ever, a, 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 a sitting uh, head of state has been issued an arrest warrant um, by the International um, Criminal Court. And, you know, I think that the Russians can say, oh, we, we don't care about that. It, you know, we're, we're not paying attention. But still... It's kind of a big deal. And people, I mean, the stories are still in the papers every day about it. Um, it means not that Vladimir Putin does a whole lot of travel. Uh, he doesn't, um, but he can't. He can't now without worrying about being arrested. And there is um, interesting law questions that are happening because uh, as I understand it, and we don't know everything yet, because I don't think we've seen the whole indictment, um, this is all going to be about occupation law. Because um, what the Russians did is move Ukrainian children from places where they were the occupying force, and they claim that they were moving them for humanitarian reasons. But international law says you can't do that. So they have legal liability in places like Kherson, where they were moving kids out of orphanages, or they were moved, they were separating parents from their children at filtration camps from places like Kherson, or they were taking children of the parents who'd been arrested for somehow being in some sort of resistance as the Russians sought. Uh, you can't do any of those things under international law. Um, and so occupation law will then be relevant to other countries on this planet who are occupation forces and what they do with the civilians in those places. And so we may have some interesting, uh, you know, law cases at the ICC about, and, and that's why all of this gets important, uh, because you don't know what the consequences, you cannot ever uh, that's why you know international justice is not about you. <laughs> you you don't know who the stakeholders will be. I thought that was such a smart way to think about it. When I get into a cynical mood about what difference does this make, and if you if you 
if you're paying a lot of attention, there are moments that you think, ah, who cares? But yes, there's reasons to care. Yeah, and because it, you can you can think of these efforts as just after the fact to punish tasks that have already you know actions that have already been taken, but they do have some deterrent um, mission of of in some ways hoping to change the calculations of those who might commit crimes in the future, um, at least in 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 hope that it could spin off those types of implications and prevent future crimes as well as as punishing past ones. Yes. I mean, here's a very interesting example of this. So um, after Bucha, which was the the first town in Ukraine where everybody went, oh, my God, when the Russians left, we saw, you know, what had happened there. And we know who it was. It was the 64th Mechanized Brigade who came. So it's not a surprise. But who are those people? Well, um, soon after, it was very clear and, and Ukrainian prosecutors publicized the crimes there as much as they possibly could, um, all of a sudden, things like satellite imagery came into play. And, and in this war, this is the first time we saw that. So the Russians said, yeah, we know there's a lot of dead Ukrainians on the ground there, but see, that wasn't us. The Ukrainians came after us. And, and the next thing you know is people are citing what I call the Wayback Machine. You can, you can look at satellite photographs and say, can I have that three days ago? And you can get it. And so it was shown, not that this was not a court of law, this was a court of public opinion, but it was shown that those people were on the ground dead before the Ukrainians got there. Um, second thing. So Putin gives the 64 mechanized a the highest order you can in Russia. And he does it very soon after they leave. It's like, what? You know, these guys have just been labeled as monsters and Putin is giving them a huge award. Uh, But then the next thing he does is disband them. So you can't find them again if, in fact, you're Ukrainian and you would like to arrest one of them. Um, They are not as easily recognizable as they were. But on the Ukrainian side, they can identify them through... uh, through the technology on their on their phones, which is uh, face recognition uh, apps, because most of the face recognition apps in that part of the world are trained on Russian AI, so they recognize Russian faces better than anything else. So this war has I can see um, technology 2.0 in this war as opposed to Syria. Um, AI um, face recognition, that didn't work because Syria didn't have a big Facebook um, data bank to be able to do that. Videos often were 12 seconds long, especially in the early part of the war because the bandwidth wasn't that big. Somebody told me that there is 10 times more video than the length of the war now in Ukraine. So it's 10 years of video because we've had a year of war. That's how much video there is. That's how much documentation there is. And it's all in real time. And and the evidence that Yale collected, think about this, that was done in real time. I mean, that didn't happen in Bosnia. You know, all the the stuff about um, rape uh, and the rape camps, that was all done well after the end of the war. This is the first war we've ever seen. Um, Syria somewhat, but towards the end where evidence of war crimes is being collected as the war crimes are being committed. And an indictment was issued before the end of the war. That I mean, I don't know what this is going to mean. I don't think we know what it's going to mean because it's so new. Yeah, it's dizzying almost. Mm-hmm. Wow. Your last comments there mentioned a sort of court of public opinion. So we have on the one hand, these actual court cases and trials and very legalistic. And on the other hand, um, uh, media attention, social media, public opinion, evidence getting out and circulating. What role do you think this um, court of public opinion and uh, the way this information circulates mobilizes outrage or does not mobilize outrage, uh, mobilizes societies or, or goes and become people become desensitized to it? How does all that unfolding um, interact with the legal aspects or not? 
So I, I will speak about a very specific legal aspect and the court of public opinion, and that is this. What the Ukrainians want is a international tribunal. Uh, and they want it because um, the ICC doesn't have the jurisdiction to charge Russia with the crime of aggression. This goes back to Nuremberg. So, you know, before Nuremberg, there weren't laws like this. It was all done um, by three men. Uh, two of them uh, lived in Lviv. One who writes the law on genocide, um, Mr. Lemkin, and a man who writes the law on, on crimes against humanity. And it is a Soviet judge who writes the law of aggression. And the law of aggression, this is pre-United Nations. There, there is a, a, a part of the uh, the UN charter that is you can't, you know, you can't roll across the border and, and just eat up your neighbor. Uh, but before that, it was it was law, the law of aggression. And that was the overarching, the law that subsumes all of the other laws, the king of laws, the queen of laws. Because once you can show the law of aggression, you don't kind of have to bother with the rest of it. Everything is a crime against humanity. Everything is a war crime. Genocide's a little trickier. You have to prove genocide. Uh, but the rest of it is, and it is the leadership crime, right? You can go all the way to the top with the war, war of aggression. It is such a powerful law that most people wanted to kill it, which they managed to do when the International Criminal Court's final um, final form was set. You know, the Americans, the Brits, the French, they kind of strong-armed um, everybody into this notion that you can't uh, charge the crime of aggression on a country that hasn't joined the ICC. And I said, okay, we won't do that. So then the Americans and the Brits and the French don't join the ICC. And they don't because... Um, I'm sure you will remember, uh, there's a moment in history when the world kind of says what the Americans did in Iraq was an illegal war, a war of aggression. Um, and so they kind of want to stay out of the dock, the Americans, because they say, no, it wasn't, uh, not at all. Uh, but they don't care to make that case uh, at the International Criminal Court. Uh, so here's the problem right now. Um, they can't get a war of aggression charge against Russia in the International Criminal Court. There's only one place that you can do that, and that would be to have an international tribunal. How are you going to do that? Well, you can't put it through the Security Council because the Russians and the Chinese will veto it. So now you have to go to the General Assembly. But here's the problem in the General Assembly. Most of the global South thinks the Americans were criminals in Iraq. So why are you bothering us with this thing with Putin? I mean, isn't that the same thing the Americans did? Why should we vote for that? I mean, you know, it's money for us. It's it's Chinese investment. It's Russian investment. Really, we want to get on the wrong side of, of Russia for, for something that they did that, I don't know, looks to us like Iraq. So the court of public opinion is now in, extremely important. You, I mean, and I think that the Ukrainians have just twigged onto this. We must now appeal to the global South and say, no, 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 this, this is bad. Um, you should be against this. You should not be for any attempt by a neighbor to roll across the border. It's not quite what the Americans did. So we shall see if, if we get a reset right now. And the reset, and I've heard uh, human rights lawyers say this, yes, you know, it was hypocrisy, no doubt about that, with how the Americans behaved. But let's have a set point again. Let's start anew and say, all right, now we're going to have accountability. Why can't we do that? And we'll see. We'll see. That's where I think the court of public opinion comes in. Wow. So, on the, so we have, on the one hand, this um, enormous mobilization of, of people's talents and skills from the grassroots mobilizing evidence, um, this uh, amazing technological uh, possibilities that are totally unprecedented, you know, meeting against the the hard brick wall of, of political will and states self-interests. And, and uh, uh, that, that's where, where justice sort of hits the, 
the wall, um, but not necessarily, especially with these with these new new dynamics, um, which, as you say, can't be dismissed because even if you approach them with a tremendous skepticism, you don't know how things are going to unfold. And once unleashed, uh, the sort of processes they they spin into to motion. So, in the end of the day, are you? optimistic that we could see the end of this age of impunity or, or age of impunity transforming into a post impunity age and what might that look like? How would, where do you come down? So I'm always optimistic and I talk to other people who are atrocity correspondents or war crimes investigators and we all talk about how, you know, we have this part of our brain that's like a dog stomach. You know, we can take in anything and just close it off in there because at some moment, if you do this kind of work and don't have a, a sense of humor, you won't survive it. You won't. Um, and so I think that you you are optimistic because why else can you, I mean, you can't keep going unless you think that something good is going to come out of all of this. Um, so yes, but I think that is simply a DNA question and not a you know, uh, has anything hit you that has changed your mind about this? Um, and I think that I am um, optimistic because of the effort. You have six countries who are in the joint investigative team for the ICC, and then another six who are doing this um, for the new Eurojust. I, I, it's the effort is is staggering. And look, we could have we could have some um, Syrian witnesses in Yugoslavian trials. Depends on who's you know who's in the dock. And it could I have seen interviews with pilots who bombed Ukraine and bombed Syria. So if they go to court, it's not out of the question that you could have a Syrian witness. Um. Wow. So I. I, I... I want to bring in um, the audience's question, and I also want to remind everyone that you can put your questions in the Q and A section. I, um, I I have so many questions myself, and at some point, I'm going to use my privilege of asking them of both of you. But for now, there's a question that actually um, segues really nicely with Wendy's last question to you, Deb, which is in some ways not just about your optimism or your positive views about the future, but the form that it would take is the question. So they're talking about the, the question is that every week there are specialists in international law who are debating how justice should be achieved for Ukraine. Um, should it be a hybrid institution? Should it be a specially constituted war crimes chamber? Um, and the uh, person who has the question says all of these have been used for the past three decades. I'm going to change the question a little bit to link it also to Syria and say, we know we, you explained to us in what ways you're thinking positively about the future, but specifically what shape does that positive way of thinking in terms of the actuality of justice um, take and how has that been influenced by what happened with Syria and the question of um, justice for the Syrian war. So I, I actually think what the Germans did was the beginning of a movement in, in Europe. I mean, they had a reason to do it. They had a million Syrians. They understood that most of them were there, not because so much of the war, although that was some of it, but because of this system of torture. I mean, I heard some people in the Syrian community talk about 50,000 people out of that million who'd been directly affected by, you know, the, the torture regime in Syria, 50,000. And if you take in a million people in your country who, who most of them, their religion is different than yours, they come from a completely different culture, and you want them to um, figure out how to live in a democratic state, what better demonstration project than to have a war crimes trial to show what accountability looks like and how the rule of law works. Now, whether anybody ever said that out loud, I'm not completely sure, but that certainly was what it, what it turned into. And, you know, the Syrian community paid a lot of attention. Now, let us remember that the Syrian community is not all anti-regime because it's not. And certainly, 
in uh, Germany, there is a huge contingent of people who are loyal to Hezbollah, who were pro-Assad, they are in Germany. Um, and there are a lot of regime people who just figured Germany was a great place to get to, and they had a million other Syrians who were covered. Uh, so, you know, the message was complicated in the Syrian community. I do think that it's the beginning of a movement of accountability, because remember, Europe was, I, I mean, that was really an amazing event in 2014 and 15, with all those people walking through the forests of Europe. So um, let's see, and, and because it was the beginning of a movement, you know, there was a there was a table set to be able to take on Ukraine right away. You know, both Germany and France began to do structural investigations on day three of the Russians crossing the border. That I mean, that was kind of because they were set up for it. They, they'd already hired everybody they needed to do it. So they just pivoted. Um, the people who were doing the Syrian trials, they all did the same thing. They just pivoted because they were already in this forward motion. I don't know where that gets us. It's what I want to go and watch. I really don't. You know, I just came from a conference at Catholic University. Beth, Ambassador Beth Van Schaff was there. She is the State Department's ambassador for war crimes uh, tribunals and events. I, I'm not sure what the official title is, but she announced that the U.S. is going to back a hybrid court. That means it will happen in Kiev, which I thought was an interesting announcement because, and be, because of how early it is. It sounded to me like they are giving up on the idea of taking it to the General Assembly. That, that it's worse to get a no vote than to, to get no vote at all. It seemed like that's what they were saying. Now, it's early days. You know, you can't have any of these trials in absentia. So somebody has to show up before you get to have one. So Milosevic doesn't come to court for, what, another 10 years after the war, I think. Things change. He's out of favor. Somebody else is ruling the country. Uh, Serbia is given a get out of jail free card. We'll lift your sanctions if you give them up. They do. Could that happen to Putin? Yes, it could. And he knows it could happen to him. That's why he wants to stay in power. So there's too many moving parts to declare optimism. But all those moving parts are interesting to watch because they tell us little things about how it's how it's going. I'm wondering what Wendy, whether there's a feedback loop in terms of what Deb is talking about back into because because I think the argument that you're making so persuasively in some ways is, you know, as you said, Syria was a dress rehearsal, then you get Ukraine in terms of a whole set of both structural things in terms of court but also the idea of justice um, for war crimes in these two particular cases. But I'm wondering, um, and for Wendy, but for both of you, because you both worked with Syrian refugees today, whether there's then a feedback loop back into the Syrian um, refugee communities who see that link, or do they even perceive that to be a link? And does that then create a different sense of hope for the Syrian communities outside of Syria in terms of what is possible looking at Ukraine and what is going on today? Or is that just not on anybody's radar in that sense? I can say in the, with the, the, Syri the conversations I've had with, with Syrians, and not so much I think a feedback loop of, oh, this is working in Ukraine, what could it mean for us? But, but absolutely there's a, a vast discussion about the trials that have happened in Germany uh, as, as they've witnessed with the, the Syrian war criminals themselves, this is, is, is there's been an enormous amount of, of, of conversation and attention in Syrian communities. And what I've heard from Syrians, um, both the people I talk to, as well as podcasts and writings and a lot of expression and people uh, commenting on these, exactly as Deb said, I mean, a sense of pride, a sense of, of meaningfulness, a sense of, no, this is not justice. Justice with a big J 
nothing can achieve justice given what Syria has lost and what people have suffered. But this is meaningful, meaningful on the level of at least some people have been held accountable, um, important on the level of now the world can see it's not just, you know, there's been so much misinformation and so much delegitimation and so much from the, the you know, the Syrian regime itself saying that people, that, that, that what the, the upholding their narrative of a, of a, a legitimation of yes, it's true. We were tortured. We were killed. The regime does this, and now it can't be denied. It's been held up and verified in a court of law um, that we've had our our moment. And uh, so it's been enormously. Um, it's I think one of the few areas where, for many Syrians who identified with the uprising, see space of of hope and possibility. And and. Um, there's still work that can be done and work something that can be achieved. So there's some sort of the accountability front, there's this mobilization on going for, for, for the disappeared. Um, that's very inspiring for people, those who've been lost in detention and the, and the families that are very active in keeping their word on the, on the, in, in the, the news. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's very, very meaningful. I think on lots of levels, politically active, you know, mobilizing and inspiring and, uh, something that people can say, we've accomplished this against all odds, and who knows what we might still going forward. So I'll say this. Um, I think in the early days, uh, in February 24th, first couple of weeks, of course, the Syrians said things like, oh, look at how they're treating the Ukrainian refugees. You know, it's because they're white, it's because they're Christian, because they have blue eyes. And over time, I think many Syrians understood that this was an existential moment for Europe. You know, Syria, if Syria collapsed and it's, you know, uh, and at some stage of that, Europe would survive it. Um, and still they took a million Syrians. And I think that that notion settled itself out when, you know, the, the people began to, to analyze. And then you saw, SAMS, the Syrian American Medical Association, go to Ukraine and set up clinics. And then you saw, um, you know, people who had made it in Germany, Syrians, go to the border and, you know, move uh, supplies into Ukraine. They felt a kinship. They understood everything about what was happening in Ukraine because it had happened to them, including the torture. Um, you know, at the, at the hands of Russians. Now, they were tortured at the hands of Syrians, but nevertheless, they understood torture. And so I think over time, even um, there was a German who had been in an NGO in, in Syria. He was arrested, tortured for four months. And where is he now? He's in Ukraine. And of course he's in Ukraine because that experience in Syria radicalized him in a way that he feels that he needs to go and help in that one because he was in the other one and he he understood what was happening there. So, I mean, this is a mixed picture, but it gets very, very personal for people about, you know, what Putin is doing and what he did to them. Um, can we stay a little bit longer on the question of um, Syrian refugees? So, um, and then we'll transition back um, into the question of um, justice and um, international law. But there's a question since we're talking about this about uh, the situation of Syrian refugees in Germany, which both of you actually have worked with and in and have been in conversation with them. So the question is that, you know, studies have shown that in Germany, many of the Syrian population are facing challenges like social discrimination and isolation. Some people have been reported missing. So the, what is the socioeconomic condition of Syrian refugees in Germany today? And do you have a sense of how many have already returned to Syria are they planning on going to Syria? And I know, um, Wendy, your latest book is about the notion of home also. Uh, just wondering what you guys have found in your own research on the situation of the Syrian refugees in Germany today. 
you could start. There's 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 so much to say. It deserves a, a you know webinar in its its own right. Um, I can say that um, I personally have, don't know anyone or or uh, who has returned to Syria. I've heard rumors of some very exceptional cases. Um, the, the the UNHCR does try to have um, to keep some sort of statistics about what they call voluntary repatriations. My understanding is that um, they're very still small in number and the overwhelming number are coming from Syrians um, in countries on Syria's border and in, in Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan. There are Certainly some returning from Europe to Syria, but I think they're, they're very anecdotally seem very, very sort of small in, in, in numbers. Um, as far as social discrimination and isolation, yes, but there's also, I can say again, anecdotally in my own experience, having spent five summers in Berlin since 2016, tremendous success stories of um, Syrians who've learned German, uh, who are integrated into the workforce. You have uh, people who against all odds um, became certified to be doctors or pharmacists uh, again. Um, you have uh, hundreds of thousands of children who, um, who even surveys show say they feel a sense of belonging to Germany as well as being, as being Syrians. So there's um, uh, almost um, almost a, a lack of, of, of almost sometimes I find exciting stories to tell because so many people have kind of moved on and in, in, in a normal everyday sort of life. And the best news is almost no news. Uh, the people I've met in 2016 who were still in refugee shelters or trying to struggle to get out of refugee shelters were extremely precarious, were overwhelmed by a bewildering bureaucracy that they would never learn the language felt you know, culturally and socially isolated, now have, have carved out a space uh, for themselves in, in, in Germany. Of course, there's still all sorts of, of troubles and difficulties, some of which relate to being in Germany and some of which relate to, uh, to being Syrian and still struggling with watching their, their country um, uh, continue to descend into, into crisis, to continue to struggle with the loss and war. Um, and the struggle of being and in, integrating into Germany is one part of this multidimensional challenge that they face as, as humans, but in some ways is, um, is one aspect of life where things are going pretty well. And, and I know there was a, a lot of uh, discussion on the five-year anniversary of the 2015 sort of summer of, of migration um, that headline after headline said, this is a success story and Angela Merkel's, you know, a bargain uh, and gamble worked out. And there are, of course, the, the, you know, exceptions to that rosy picture. But I think many would agree that um, Germany's acceptance of a, of a million Syrian and other refugees um, has, has really turned out remarkably well, both for Germany and the refugees and migrants they accepted. That would be my, my judgment. I completely agree. I, yes, there are people who are isolated. I, I have no doubt about that. Um, and yes, it has upended people's lives. I, you know, think about they walked through Europe, many of them. Uh, they come with incredible trauma uh, and trauma is hard and trauma can isolate you. But on the other hand, you know, I asked, I want, I want, I finally asked some of the German organizations, can I see some of your stars? You know, it's easy. I was covering a war crimes trial. So everybody I was talking to had been a torture victim. And so that I realized that that was skewing the way that I saw the community. So I asked, I, I, I'd like a star, please. And I got Hani Bilbazi, and Hani had come early. His mother, was a Palestinian working for UNRWA teaching English. Her, her, his father was a lawyer and he worked for in the Ministry of, of Interior, uh, also Palestinian. Both of them um, were hunted down by both the regime and ISIS because they were trying to help Palestinians who lived in Yarmouk. So they got on the boat, they went to Greece, they did the whole thing, they got to Germany. And Hani got two rounds of... Um, of language school 
uh, cause he was early and it didn't work the first time. And so he was like a test rat. <laughs> and so they felt, oh, you need a little bit more to learn German. Um, and now he runs all the computers for all the garbage trucks in Berlin. And his parents run a fabulous restaurant in Charlottenburg um, cooking Syrian food. Um, the dad runs the bar and the mom is the cook. And they're both, you know, educated to the hilt, but that's what they're doing. And, and you know, it's in the middle of a very German neighborhood, but they're doing just fine. Um, in a very funny way, when um, the Ukrainians came and the Germans gave them a pass on one thing. So when the Syrians arrived, they had to live in refugee uh, compounds and they had to learn German until they were allowed out uh, to go get jobs because you really need to speak German if you're going to work there. They, they said to the Ukrainians, oh, don't, don't worry, you don't need to learn German. Here's the problem. They can't get jobs because you need to speak German. And so it's been a real problem for, for the Ukrainians because uh, of this language barrier. And in, in some ways for the Syrians, like, oh, huh. <laughs> we're doing better because we learned German. And they, and they are. The Syrians are doing just fine. I actually think I've eaten at that restaurant. So, Have you? In Charlottenburg? <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did, um, but I didn't know the story behind it. Uh, we have actually um, a really big question for both of you. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to ask, because it, it's aimed at, this is from our um, faculty leave fellow, Peter Krause, but it's aimed at both uh, Wendy and Deb. So I'm going to ask Wendy first the question, and then I'm going to ask Deb the exact same question um, as a way of rounding out this um, conversation. And so the question for both of you, from the perspective, Wendy, of an academic, and then Deb, for you from the perspective of a journalist, is whether there's a consensus code of ethics to share evidence, testify, and cooperate with international war crimes tribunals um, that involve countries or individuals that you've conducted research with. In other words, what are the ethical boundaries for this incredible work that you both are doing from the perspective of academics, Wendy, and then for you, Deb, from the perspective of journalists? Um, thank you so much, Peter, for that um, tough and important question. So um, I can start us out, but then say that I think in many sort of academic codes of, eth of, of ethics, we're a couple steps behind journalist codes of ethics. I, so, so, so maybe we, what Deb can let us know what's out there, and journalists will take a bit, a bit, a bit longer to incorporate into to academic research ethics. But the short answer is, Peter, I there's nothing I know of as far as any sort of consensus code. Um, I mean, I think there is some literature about uh, people who re academics researching on illegal activities and what might be their legal obligation to report some sort of um, uh, crime. Um, I'm not I'm not that familiar with that literature, but I, I believe that has been addressed. Um, I don't think it's yet been incorporated into questions about international crimes and war crimes and what this could mean for the kinds of 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 of, of litigation that that Deb has been talking about but it's I think a new enough um or a, a, or dynamic enough field where there's so much new and that's happening that maybe this is we're at the at the cutting edge of something that that will be be developed. I mean, my understanding is, is, is a lot of the, the research ethics of this, in the social sciences where we, we work is really focused on protections of, of the rights and well-being of research participants. Um, uh, and one, as you know, one move in that realm is in special sensitivity to people who've sort of trauma-informed research and research with, with victims of trauma, concern about traumatization or re-traumatization. And one thing that some researchers have developed there is the idea of, of having available for research participants some list of resources um, that if someone seems to be uh, having experiencing distress at the end of an interview or a session, you could say, here are some, you know, resources if you need to seek therapy or mental health support or something of that sort. I can imagine something in the future where, where we might say in addition to that, you know, in addition to this list of resources, not only if you wanted to seek mental health uh, 
um, uh, support. But if you would like to talk to experts collecting evidence for war crimes, because in this, this session you've indicated things uh, that could be considered war crimes, then maybe I could help link you up to one of these organizations and then leave it in the hands of a research participant, giving that sort of helping to give them resources if they wanted to follow up and share their story with one of these organizations um, could be one alternative to the researcher him or herself reporting that data on which gets into as we know all sorts of concerns about confidentiality and anonymity and what might violate pre-informed consent so um thank you for putting this on the table i think it's something that most academics have not discussed yet but uh but should and neither have we um okay. there's no rules to this game um, I remember when the Yugoslav tribunal kicked off, uh, there was some reaching out to some journalists. There was a Wall Street Journal journalist who uh, was in Srebrenica and he was asked to testify, which he did. And I remember that all of us uh, in the journalism community who had also covered it thought that that was the most terrible thing we'd ever heard of. If you want to know what I reported, read my stuff. You know, the idea is that we don't tell you the other stuff, right? We're journalists. So if we wrote it, that's all you get. But he did. Now, good Lord, it's changed. Um, so, you know, in Syria, it, it, you know, the, the research was done by CJA, the Center for Investigative and Accountability. Um, and that was a document process. It wasn't a journalism process. In Ukraine, it's crazy what's happening. So you have these joint investigative teams. These are national efforts at evidence collecting. But then you have people like Truth Hounds or the 5 a.m. coalition. And they're all uh, collecting. Some of them are academics. Some of them are journalists. Some of them are just computer geeks. Um, and then you have the Reckoning Project. It's all journalists. And they are out interviewing people. And the problem now in, is, and you will hear this from the investigators, is it's chaos. So the problem is you can wreck a witness by interviewing them too many times. Because if they don't say exactly the same thing every time, then they cannot be put on the sand. And this is happening now. And it's terrifying people who see this as uh, a, a failure in the ability to organize evidence. I think that's why CJA was hired by the Ukrainians. Like they realize, oh my God, you know, we have a problem with organizing. They've got 90,000 cases. That's impossible. That's till, you know, the end of time, uh, that many cases. Um, and that, this is before it was even announced the Americans would like to see a hybrid case in Ukraine. Um, so I I don't know how Ukraine, how people are going to get a hold of this. I really don't. I don't see anything yet that is an or, organizing principle. We'll I see. Think it's the difference. It's, it's a very confusing difference to me that in the Syria. So, so Syria, so remember, Syria was an uprising. Um, and, and, and Russia was legally there and they were bombing people with airplanes. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of movement on the ground and certainly there weren't, I mean, just think about Ukraine for a minute. There's a foreign legion that's there. There are foreigners who are fighting for the Ukrainian army. Uh, there are NGOs that piled in. Um, there's these guys from the JIT, the Joint Investigative Team. That, that, that you know, it's it's Lithuanian policemen. Um, uh, it's uh, Polish um, uh, lawyers. It's just astonishing who's in. Those people could not have gotten into Syria. They would because they would have been on the other side. And and so if you're willing to risk running down to the bomb shelter for in your hotel room, you're welcome to come. So that's um, why it's, I, that's why it is so different. I, I've never seen anything like this. Wow, we have only a couple more minutes left. I want to leave it um, to the two of you to see if you have any final thoughts. Um, I don't want to leave this conversation on whether I'm willing to go get 
bomb to get a story or risk my life. But um, if any closing thoughts that you guys have, please, um, we'd love to hear it. Well, I would just have a closing question for Deb, which is, what do you recommend that we all look for um, following this story? What are you going to keep your eye on? What do you think uh, the rest of us should really pay attention to? So that's a hard question. Uh, and it's a question I'm just learning to answer. And I find you just got to pay attention all the time, which is not realistic. I mean, for example, one day out of nowhere, The Guardian runs a, a story that says uh, a guy from the 64th mechanized um, somehow escaped from Russia, showed up in Spain and asked if he could please testify in a war crimes tribunal against what happened in Bucha. It's like, where did that come from? And so I keep waiting for the second story. I haven't seen it yet, but boy, do I have my Google, you know, alert set for that one. Um, I think what you watch for are the big movements. Where will a war crimes tribunal be? Uh, what does the, um, you know, when we finally uh, find out what the indictment says, you know, what, what law is it based on? Those are really interesting things to watch. Um, and now we know we're going to get those things, you know, because now we have an indictment. So I think it's the the big stuff that you have to watch uh, if you actually have a life, <laughs> as, a, as opposed to being a correspondent that's watching it, that you actually saw the Guardian piece and you still remember it. <laughs> But final final thoughts. So I'm going to say something about journalism is we never have final thoughts because that's the whole point of doing what you do. You know, there's always tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, so it's always hard for me to have any final. Here's what I think, because I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I cover it every day and every 10 years I write a book about it. So um, I'll talk to you in 10 years and tell you what my final thoughts are. <laughs> Well, I hope you talk to me before 10 years. I will. <laughs> it's final thoughts. That was the category. <laughs> this has been such a privilege and a pleasure to hear you both speak about your fascinating work and to, I always learn when I talk to each of you individually, but together, um, it's just been really incredible. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your um, expertise and insights with all of us. And to our audience, uh, looking forward to seeing you at our next Crown Seminar on April 19th. And with that, once again, thank you and um, talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.